Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today at IBPSA for our second installment of the coming healthcare uh, insurance plan and what you need to know today to get started on getting your healthcare plan made. My name is Carmen Rustenbeck. I'm the CEO and founder of International Boarding and Pet Services Association. We're joined today by Natalie Oates, our vendor member concierge, who's handling our webinar for us, and Tracy Kaiser, who's the president and CEO of the Kaiser Group, who will be building our, she's the underwriter company, and will be delivering our plan for us. Before we get started on our webinar today, I wanted to remind you that this webinar will be recorded and placed in the member uh, dashboard, and we will have a link provided on the Facebook page. Also, um, we do have a landing page at ibpsa.com forward slash insurance, where you can go and you can download information that you need as, it, as it's made available to us. You'll be able to go there right away and download insurance information, forms to fill out, that kind of thing. So um, look for that. And um, we do have last week's webinar recorded in full in the member dashboard and on the IBPSA.com website. That uh, webinar is a little bit over an hour. There were a lot of questions toward the end of that webinar that we will probably review again today. But if you want to have the full spectrum of everything we're offering, each week that we do a webinar with healthcare, it will be different for each week. So you'll get to see different PowerPoint slides. You'll get a little bit more information. We'll be able to update you about how the underwriting process is going. So we encourage you to, if you can't attend, to at least go to the member dashboard and make sure you can take some time to look at the PowerPoints hear Tracy's presentation, and most of all, hear the questions and answers that happen at the end that might help you decide what you're going to do next. So again, um, we're with Tracy Kaiser, who's the president and CEO of the Kaiser Group. We, get, we did a full introduction of her last week. And Tracy, thank you for joining us again this week to talk to us more about this coming health care plan and what we need to do to be involved. My pleasure, Carmen. Thank you for having me today. And thank you to everybody who was on the webinar last week as well, and also those who were not but submitted their information. Um, we had a tremendous um, response from the folks submitting their information. And as uh, you can imagine, of course, that information is scrubbed, and then it goes into underwriting and preparation for the overall association health plan um, elevation. Um, just to give you a, a kind of a brief update without any specifics, uh, certainly some of your members are already scheduled for uh, later this week and early next week for uh, introductory conversations and plan uh, development um, phone meetings, if you will, so that we can um, hone in on the specifics that they want in their plans and obviously price those accordingly so they can meet their installment deadlines. Um, if you have not been, I, I believe that almost everyone has been contacted um, at least by email if you've submitted your information. Um, if you've been contacted by email, the next contact you will receive is a request for a phone conversation. Um, either my staff will reach out to you independently or uh, by email or by telephone or both and uh, schedule a time for a consultation so we can walk through uh, information with you. The objective, of course, uh, in the presentations, uh, webinars each week is to create a cumulative level of education and obviously to provide status updates because our objective is to meet everyone's deadlines, those who have those December deadlines, those who have traditional renewals at 1-1, et cetera. Um, there's a whole host of deadlines that have to be met. So don't be concerned about anybody missing your deadlines. Everybody is very focused on that as well. Uh, but as it relates to the webinars themselves, our objective is to provide education because things have really changed in the world of healthcare. Um, the, uh, the years past, um, you know, it wasn't as big of an expense as it is today. Today it is one of the top five, uh, many times top three cost drivers, and is quite uh, high as it relates to the expense load for every business owner. And so, you know, the old days, people used to, you know, just shop for it like they shop for other things that were kind of annoying to them. They would say, gosh, you know, we do it once a year. That's the only time we look at it. 
And you know what? Uh, hopefully I have someone on staff that can take care of it and just run the numbers by me, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those days are really gone because it's too important a decision. It's too expensive a decision. Um, and anybody who's running a business obviously shops price for everything in today's world because profit margins are much less. And so if you're, you know, buying items in bulk and you're shopping for 10 cents less a pound or you're buying supplies or whatever the situation is, you really have to throw this in that same category. And, and as a business owner, really take the approach, I've got to understand what I'm buying and I have to understand um, how it's priced and I need to shop it really continually. Um, one of the questions last week was, you know, can I make a change at a time other than when my renewal is, is there? Well, of course, anyone can. Um, anybody who has an insurance plan can make a change any month uh, with giving 30 days notice um, because it is a month-to-month -month contract in, in most all insurance plans. There may be some unique situations with minimum premium requirements based upon the structure of your plans, but for the most part, you have a 30-day uh, cancellation clause. So quite frankly, you should be shopping it and you should be uh, understanding it and pricing it um, for uh, on a consistent basis to meet your objectives from a budgetary standpoint. You know, the days of the insurance broker walking in the door with a spreadsheet and, and going through things that no one understands, and then the customer simply purchasing the lowest cost um, just are really over. It's, there's too much at risk these days. Um, there's too many great plans out there. There's too much that you can do as it relates to your medical plans to help reduce costs that you don't have to take anything at face value anymore. And quite frankly, if an insurance broker walks in your door or if someone you might have been working with for a period of time and is not managing your plan, is not you know integrating themselves into the customer service, is not negotiating um, situations, and I don't mean one or two percentage point, but negotiating you know the, the provider uh, contracts, et cetera, for you on your behalf, um, you really have to look elsewhere because you have to question why you're paying that uh, insurance broker just to bring a spreadsheet in once a year. So those are a little bit, maybe a little bit of uh, aggressive comments, but at the same time, I think it's important. It's an important subject matter um, that is just kind of blown over each year. And of course, from a financial perspective, it is also a point of heavy stress for most business owners. So our objective over the next few weeks, aside from working with each of you independently on your plans and elevating the entire AHP association plan uh, structure, is to make sure that you're very well educated. A few of the things before we get started um, are that, you know, for those of you who have questions that might be very, very specific, we should likely handle those in specific uh, individual calls or emails. Uh, only because oftentimes they are related to the geography you live in, which are state-specific geographies. And of course, insurance law is governed by the states. Of course, we have some federal incorporation now because of AHP or association health plans, but there are a lot of unique situations that belong to states like California, like New York, like Massachusetts, et cetera, um, that really don't affect a lot of other states. And so just kind of keep that in mind that there are some answers for some people that are different than answers for other people. But as we uh, move forward, um, I just want to kind of create a starting point because I'm not convinced everyone really understands the differences in the medical plans that are available to you today. And, and this is just a short list. There's certainly many variations of these as well. But most of what everyone is experienced in seeing when someone comes in your door with health plans are, you know, the, the gamut called PPO, HMO, EPO, POS, and HDHP plans. And that's, you know, the insurance industry is well known for doing a lot of acronym work. So we all have, have become familiar with PPOs, and we understand that those actually are the preferred provider organizations. And, um, and uh, you know, from a, from a standpoint of is that better, is that worse than anything else? Well, the difference is between that and an HMO, with a preferred provider organization, uh, you know, obviously you have more choice of doctors. That's one of the attractiveness of, that is the attractiveness of a PPO network. And of course, most people are familiar with PPO networks because they are more expensive than HMOs. And if you live in a metropolitan area, you're very, very familiar with HMOs, of course. Typically, you see a little bit of higher out-of-pocket cost when you have a PPO plan, and you have an out-of-network and in-network scenario. So you pay less when you're in-network, and you pay more when you're out-of-network. Um, though typically you have a fair amount of freedom, you know, as it relates to choosing doctors. And oftentimes doctors you have 
grown up with, gotten used to, you know, like to frequent, et cetera, are doctors that are in those PPO networks. And oftentimes, the first question when you're looking at a PPO plan that is in your mind is, gosh, is my doctor in that network? And that's everyone's question. Um, so we have solved that problem, fortunately, for the association. And we'll talk about that just a little bit later in the program. But an HMO plan, and many of you are familiar, not everybody, but many of you are familiar with HMOs. HMOs are health maintenance organizations. And, you know, you know the name Kaiser um, as a Kaiser health plan, though the Kaiser that you have here on your webinar is not from Kaiser Permanente. Um, our name is spelled differently, though um, it's often confused. But just for everybody's benefit, we're not Kaiser Permanente. You have less freedom in an HMO plan, of course, and you have generally very specific facilities you go to. Um, primary care doctors usually manage the care and they refer you to specialists. And so you don't have a lot of freedom to gain the care that you want, go to the doctors you want, et cetera. It's very, very controlled by the organization. You generally may or may not have claim forms to fill out. You generally can't access your claims information as easily from a, an overall standpoint. You can from an individual uh, member standpoint. But overall, in terms of looking at the uh, claims history for a group, it's very, very difficult to get that information. So as we go into the EPO plans, of course, then you get involved in exclusive provider organizations. And you may not see a lot of this, but sometimes you do and they don't even tell you um, when a broker is introducing it to you. Also, you know, freedom to see multiple doctors. You don't have to stay within a very, very specific um, facility. But there's no, typically, there's no coverage for out-of-network provisions. Um, and if you see a provider that's, you know, out of your network, other than an emergency, you simply have to pay full cost. Generally, the network is smaller and you have lower premium than a PPO. So if someone walks in the door and says, gosh, I want to talk to you about EPO options, just know it's a lesser or skinnier network than a PPO. It's going to cost you a little bit less. And if that's acceptable, then that's perfectly fine. But you do have to stay in network. And then, of course, you have point of service plans. Your point of service plans, I, I kind of liken them a bit to the old days. Many of us who were in the business or in business in the 80s and early 90s, had point of service plans. You remember that you had a deductible and paid an indemnity. You could go kind of anywhere you wanted. And that's really the way you think about point of service plans. You have tremendous freedom um, to go pretty much anywhere you want. Um, the primary doctor does coordinate your care and refers you to specialists and so on. Um, you still have, you know, um, premium to pay. You still have deductibles and so on. And in today's world of HMOs as well, the old days you didn't have a lot of deductibles. You know, you got used to and you got drawn into the HMO world because, you know, it wasn't as much out-of-pocket expense. Well, in today's world, HMOs can be as pricey uh, from an out-of-pocket extra cost standpoint in terms of expenses, healthcare expenses, as PPOs and so on, because today's HMOs have deductibles. They have a lot of out-of-pocket expenses associated with them. They have limitations. They have exclusions. And then you have the HDHP plans, and that, that acronym is thrown around a lot. High deductible health plans are really called catastrophic plans. And as it relates to the, from a definition standpoint in the structure of healthcare, um, if you're under 30, you're able to purchase catastrophic plans and still be, meet Obamacare standards, of course. Obviously, there are lower premiums. And of course, you have three, usually typically, again, I'll give you the typical answers. You typically have three primary care visits a year before your deductibles start to apply. And you have pre, free preventive care. So it really is there to take care of catastrophic situations so people are not bankrupting themselves, of course, and going into, um, you know, situations um, that they can't take care of, particularly younger folks who oftentimes opt out of healthcare because, you know, the old phrase is, well, I'm never sick. Well, none of us are ever sick until we are, or I never get hurt. None of us get hurt until we do. And so, um, you know, it's the same scenario. It's designed to provide some coverage, but not break the bank, certainly for younger folks. But there are HDHP plans, meaning high deductible health plans out there, they just have different standards and they don't necessarily fit the definition as identified, you know, for ACA and all those types of things. High deductible health plans have a, a much higher deductible associated with them than the standard maximum amount of pocket allowable under Obamacare. Then, of course, you have the second realm, which is your self-insured plan. This area of insurance has taken a, a huge change over the course of the last 10 years. If anybody's been in business or been a part of a self-funded plan, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot more risk for the business owner, um, certainly cash calls and so on if claims went out of control. If the group had some sick people, then rates went through the roof, those types of things. Most of those controls um, and those 
extreme risk situations have gone by the wayside because there's many new opportunities and ways to control risk and new ways to redirect risk as well. Most companies in this association category will not be candidates for what we call traditional self-funded plans because you have to have 200 or more employees to really make that work for you. However, one of the areas of self-funding that is working extremely well for employers that have 25 and even smaller, but we try to cut it at 25 or more employees are level funded plans. Those are plans that walk, talk, think, look exactly like the plan you have now. If you have, we call it the BUCAs, the Blue Crosses, you know, the or the blue, the blues, the United Healthcare's, the Cigna, Anthem, and Aetna. And so if you have any of those kinds of plans, um, level funded plans are plans that you actually have more control um, of rates, more control of the plans themselves, more control of claim activity, et cetera. And they actually administer very similar to those other plans you might, might be used to. But the advantages are they're governed by ERISA, which is federal law instead of late state law, and therefore you have the opportunity to reduce your state taxes in those environments. And then, of course, a whole host of other areas are impactful for level funded versus just your fully insured plans. And of course, you have partial self-funded plans. We won't go through that gamut, but there's a whole host of methodologies to take advantage of areas of self-funding that work for you, that don't pose new risk for you, but help you reduce costs and still deliver the same quality experience for your employee. And then of course you have what you may be hearing about now and people may be starting to present to you, which may feel like a foreign language, yet another acronym, RFPs and EBPs. And that means reference-based pricing. And actually that should be RBP. So reference-based pricing and evidence-based pricing. What's happening in the world of healthcare today, and this is important for every single person on this call to understand, is that an employer and your employees are not the client of an insurance company. The providers, meaning the doctors and hospitals, are the client of the insurance company. Um, those are the folks that the insurance companies want to keep happy. And so those contracts have become rather robust for doctors and hospitals. And you may have experienced over courses of time, or at least been knowledgeable, about claims that existed um, somewhere with familiarity that someone had a cancer situation, they were charged whatever, uh, you know, $160,000, you know, $200,000 for care. But the real cost when the, the claim was actually investigated might have been, you know, thirty five to $40,000 worth of expenses for care. Well, that's an extreme situation, but those situations are not unusual. Those are actually very, very commonplace. And because the contracts have become very robust, between providers and insurance companies, and because there's little to no oversight for the auditing of the services that are charged, um, obviously your insurance plan is hit very often with very, very high claims. Hence, that lends itself to obviously increased rates if you're you know, a, a, a mid-sized business or above, um, but certainly it, it certainly does tax, if you will, I don't mean that in the firm, form of taxes, but it does tax in terms of putting pressure on the community pool system as well. So regardless of where you are in the scale of size of business, um, you are affected by excessive health care costs. And the other side of the coin is, and again, from a statistical standpoint in the industry, we know that over 80% of all insurance claims have errors attached to them, whether that is um, improper services being charged, improper coding for services being charged, and coding is an insurance term. Uh, many of you who might be working in the veterinary side of insurance know coding, of course. But, um, but anyway, uh, as it relates to services, and I'll give a perfect example. When Obamacare first came out, and we call it ACA, but for slang is Obamacare, of course, uh, you know, there were preventive services that went into those plans that were no charge. Well, those services were then reimbursed back to the employ or the um, the physicians um, at a lesser reimbursement, and so that physician ended up not making as much money on those preventive services that were not charged, you know, in the uh, as a zero charge to the member. And so what happened is there was a big rush in the first few years of doctors, um, and this is no holds barred. This is general published information, so I'm not. Uh, calling out the doctors, but the doctors would code in, it was diagnostic instead of preventive, so they could be reimbursed at full scale. Well, it's important to catch that sort of thing because that affects your deductibles, it affects your co-pays, it affects your plan rates, and so on and so on. 
And needless to say, if you go to the doctor's office and someone asks you, uh, do you have any symptoms? If you say any symptoms, of course, you now have a diagnostic situation instead of a preventive situation. So it's just kind of a, a you know, it is activity that occurs um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And we all have to be really educated consumers in everything we do as well as healthcare. And so we try to expose um, all the things that are confusing and kind of kept away from uh, employers because we believe you need to be very educated about where you spend your money. And we don't want you to overspend your money, particularly in the area of healthcare. Um, you know, as it relates to claims, um, claims audits are another aspect of business that are quite fruitful for most businesses. Um, if your claims are audited quite regularly, and of course they're maintained properly and corrections made, then of course your rates um, become much more manageable on a general scale, of course, as a generalization for our discussion point here. Um, it is very common for us to see uh, plan documents, um, you know, application documents, uh, big long 20 page documents, many of you have signed with your insurance carriers, um, that have, uh, the employers have forfeited their rights to have their claims audited. And so that happens quite often as well. So when someone lays a document in front of you and it's 10 pages, 20 pages long, and it's the insurance company's document that you have zero interest in reading, um, please read it so that you don't forfeit your audit, um, you know, uh, rights and give away more money than you have to give away for un, uh, inappropriate uh, charges pr to providers and insurance payments from your insurance plan. So just some things to kind of be thinking about. Many of you are probably thinking, gosh, I think I have signed some of those documents and I, I haven't read them. Um, they are hard to read. There's no question about it and they're very boring, but please do read them. Um, also, as we talk about, you know, we're getting into the rate phase now. And again, I wanna thank everyone who very proactively submitted their information. And if you forgot, um, go back to that email from last week and certainly go ahead and submit it, or you can capture the information on the link that Carmen has put out. But I want you to, to I want to talk about and make sure everyone is aware of the considerations that do affect the rates. Um, because oftentimes someone may say things like, oh, just give me a product and a rate and I, I, I don't really need to give you anything. Well, this is not a commodity product. Um, as something you might buy off the store shelf. This is a very much a regulated uh, product. Uh, insurance always is. And insurance is a math equation. Um, and that's very simplistic, but that is what insurance is. It's about risk and it all relates back to math. And so there are many things that, that create a rate and you can affect some of the things that create rates. So um, the geography is one, some of those things you can't affect, of course. If you're in New York, needless to say, the rates are very different than if you're in uh, Mount Airy, North Carolina. And um, you know, we all understand those kinds of differences. Not only do you have regulatory differences, but you also have availability of care, cost of care, um, and certainly different uh, environmental um, situations that may or may not impact your health. Age and gender, I think we all know that, we all understand that. The older we get, the more prone we are to, uh, and the higher the risk is for illnesses. Um, for all of us, and the illnesses change as we get older, of course, and then if, uh, also injuries. We are more prone to injuries, different kinds of injuries, than people who are younger. Younger people are also prone to injuries, but very different kinds of injuries. And so as we get older, we don't necessarily need to be less healthy. A lot of that is greatly dependent upon, leading into health conditions, upon what we have done throughout the course of our life to either maintain or improve and maintain our health, or to really kind of disregard our health and assume, you know, it is what it is and I'm gonna just enjoy life while I enjoy it. Well, we can enjoy and still take care of our health, of course. And we know statistically speaking in today's world, and all of us have the same information because of the internet these days, but when you look at the back end of healthcare, you'll see time and time and time again, it's so much of the the very difficult and devastating illnesses are often avoided simply by the way that we handle our health care, the way that we handle our diets, the way that we handle our exercise, our environment, our environments, et cetera. So we can affect a lot of those changes. The more medications we are taking, the more likely we are to have health conditions, of course. Um, the more medications we take, obviously, the more it is exposed when you're looking at rates for health care. The, uh, the more severe, the illnesses, of course, the more you pose a risk, you or a person pose a risk to the expense of that plan. 
And so when an underwriter, for example, looks at, you know, the medications of a person or the age and genders and all those types of things, we know textbook with age and genders, what um, rate has to be applied from a textbook standpoint um, with no other medical information. But once medical information is available, of course, then that completely relates back to what is that plan going to have to pay for the cost of care for that person, which then translates back to rates. Additionally, as we look at employment, you'll find that underwriters will always ask, you know, what's the job description? What is the type of industry, et cetera, et cetera. Certain types of industries, of course, are much more um, injury. Um, and I don't mean just on the job because that's a workers' comp issue, but off the job as well. We know that, um, you know, certain types of industries, um, people are, have different kinds of health and they have different kinds of off the job injuries. And it, statistically speaking, does line up. You'd be surprised, and we would all be surprised, that we as humans um, tend to fall into patterns very easily, and we tend to really respond to the statistical um, numbers and patterns that are out there for all of us. So if we are in a certain industry, chances are our lifestyles are certain, certain uh, we have a certain lifestyle. If we are in other industries, we have a different lifestyle and so on. So it's really interesting when you get from the back end of it, but I want you to understand that these, these do affect rates. And so it is important, of course, that you have workers' comp, you have to, but it is important that we also make sure we are very honest in the way that we approach illnesses and injuries that occur on the job and off the job. Your medical insurance always will be for off the job situations and out of your car uh, situations. In other words, the word is subrogation, of course, but in other words, if someone is injured or ill due to being on the job, that's where your workers' comp comes into play. If you're driving your vehicle and you have an injury, that's where your car insurance comes into play or someone else's car insurance. If you rent an apartment and you have an injury in that apartment, that's or, or homeowner's insurance, and you have an injury at your home, that's where your homeowner's insurance comes into play. Your medical insurance is for all those other areas, um, you know, and that's called subrogation. You often see that when you have a medical claim, you know, it has to be subrogated with car insurance, et cetera. But those things are very, very important for everyone to understand and know. And all of those things affect rates. If someone's not forthcoming, if someone tries to push it over to the health insurance because they don't really understand what they're doing when they do that, or they don't understand how it affects their rates, uh, gosh, it, it is a big impact. So again, be aware of that. And then the assumption of risk is a very, very big part of rates. And the assumption of risk is based upon your deductible. In other words, if you want a deductible that's very low, a $500 deductible that we haven't seen in many years, then of course your uh, rates are gonna be higher because the insurance plan is assuming and the insurance company is assuming more of your risk. If you, on the other hand, which we see very often these days, have a $5,000 deductible, then you as an insurance member, the employee or spouse, dependents are assuming that risk and that is coming off the insurance company. So what's happened over the course of time, as you well know, is if you're an employer, you'll understand this. If you're an employee, you'll understand it both from both sides, is the employers were first hit with many years ago now, you know, you've got to find ways to reduce costs because the costs are going up. And so deductibles started to come into play. And then, of course, what was the next step? The next step was, okay, we're going to pass some of that responsibility over to the employee so they share in the burden and they share it and that will help them appreciate the benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Well, then it continued to grow and continued to expand and so on. Then pre-tax came out and well, we'll get a little bit of a tax break for the contributions the employees are making. Okay, so that's been exhausted now. So what's happening now is there is more and more contribution from the employee required um, or required by the employer, I should say more and more contribution, higher contribution in terms of dollar figure from the employer um, because the premiums have become higher, of course. And then the plans have become filled with so many holes, deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays, exclusions, limitations, uh, maximums, frequency limitations, and so on as well. And so what's happened is the insurance company still absorbs an awful amount of, uh, awful large amount of expense because the cost of care is high. But the employee and the employer, employer at the premium level, but the employee at the use level has started to take on more and more and more of that expense. So now you have an employee that is paying oftentimes, um, you know, four or $5,000 a year, if not more, for their insurance plan. They're then hit with a $5,000 deductible. 
then an 80-20 after that, if they have something happen, meaning 20% they pay for or 80% the insurance company pays for, could be 70-30, could be 50-50, et cetera. And then of course, the um, uh, co-pays, co-insurance, um, uh, exclusions, limitations, et cetera. And so that employee now, oftentimes, and you hear people say, talk about it, I pay so much for premium and now I've got an extra $12,000 out of pocket. So what employee in today's world, what employer in today's world, you know, purchasing the plan as well, has that available money? It really doesn't exist. So we have to make a, a turn. And that turn has to be, um, we have to manage our claims better. We have to manage our plans better. We have to be more intelligent in the way we design our plans, which is a big step that the association was very important to the association for its membership, is to create sustainable, long-term, medical plan options, designs, et cetera, that can support what you're trying to accomplish, can be very attractive in the marketplace, and do not just fall into all these patterns that are very destructive, quite frankly. So for, for a plan on a go-forward basis, you've got to manage it, you've got to manage claims, you've got to make conscious decisions on rates, you've got to make sure that your plan is designed truly to cover what you need to cover for yourself and your business, but not pay for things you don't need to pay for, and not just take a price because the price is presented to you. You have a tremendous amount of control in the price points that are available to you if you exercise that control and you're willing to be educated and you're willing to take those steps and demand that from the insurance people that walk in your door. So we'll move on from there. Um, otherwise, uh, we will spend hours on how to control healthcare. Um, but anyway, the component selections are also important for you as well. I want you to be aware, and I think it's important for everybody on the on the webinar to be aware that when you're looking at your plans, please don't just look at price. Price is a reflection of you taking on or your employees taking on more risk. Um, even though we will be working on uh, market-leading pricing, the low market, of course, that's out there from a retail standpoint, I, at the same time, I don't want to say just go shop price. Um, at the same time, I'm also not saying, gosh, pay an awful lot that you don't need to pay either. So, but you do need to be aware that you need to be consciously looking at the deductibles, obviously the aggregate of the deductibles in terms of how many for the family, your coinsurance, 80-20, 70-30, 50-50, 60-40, who pays what, the co-pays, which are those things like $30 for the primary care doctor visit, $10 for the, you know, primary care doctor visit, $75 for urgent care, et cetera. Um, your co-pays for prescription, you know, you see the $10, $20, $50 tiers, generic brands, formularies, non-formularies, et cetera. And those can be all over the board. Behind the scenes, what's incredibly important in those prescriptions is what they call the formulary. That is, which drugs are in which tier and, and how you drive those formularies. And again, you have a lot of control on what is happening with your prescriptions and your plan. But the formularies will drive your price through the roof. Um, in today's world, there are many, many very expensive drugs. Um, you know, some drugs for certain types of cancers, the rarer, rarer types of cancers, can be $100,000 a month. Drugs for Hep C that you see advertised late night on television um, can be four to eight thousand dollars, you know, a month. Um, many plans have now started to waive or void um, or not make them not available the specialty drugs in your plans. You're seeing that now, and if you haven't looked at your plan, it's probably there, um, so that the insurance companies are not even uh, considering picking up the high specialty drugs anymore. So others have put them into tier three levels, and so they are met with a small coinsurance. However, um, that is reflected in your rates. And so I say those things not to say, gosh, this is kind of blowing my mind and confusing me as a member I'm listening, but to let you know that you do have a lot of control. If you're a small business, you don't have any health conditions, um, you have a, a few young folks on your staff that help groom, et cetera, um, by all means, we need to be digging into those formularies and saying, gosh, why are you incorporating you know, these big expensive drugs into your prescription component of your health plan and then paying for that with you know, tens of, of hundreds of dollars you know, um, on a regular basis? But uh, so we need to be looking at these things and again, be intelligent about what we're looking at to keep the cost down. And you look at your availability in terms of, you know, what is the eligibility that's required in today's world? Well, 
you know, under the Obamacare rules, everything went to the first, you know, the 91st day. Well, you can't manage the 91st day unless you're managing eligibility every single day of every month, every year. And that's a ridiculous uh, approach for anyone to take. So the key is to um, put it into a, a format that works for everyone. Most everyone has defaulted to first of the month following 60 days in the United States. Um, that's pretty standard. And so you're cautious and you're intelligent about when you hire people. You're intelligent about when you terminate people because if you terminate someone on November 2nd, you need to pay for November's coverage, of course. If you terminate someone, if again, termination is, you know, voluntary and easily, you know, that's just going to happen and you, you just haven't thought about a date, but it was easier to terminate someone on October 31st, then you don't pay for November's premium. So things like that are always important as well. Full-time versus full-time equivalents. Full-time folks we all think about as 40 hours or more. Some people think about them as 35, 32 hours, 30 hours. Well, the full-time equivalent language is now paramount in everything we do. Full-time equivalent people are 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month average. If you have people that are seasonal and they fall back under um, for an extended period of time, then they fall back out of eligibility and they're not necessarily eligible for benefits again. When they come back and they're on for an extended period of time again, they become eligible just like a new hire. So there are, there are things that, again, you need to ask questions about. You need to be thinking about from your internal HR standpoint, and you need to be monitoring and managing to help reduce your costs. And then spouse and children. Everybody thinks, gosh, a plan should have employee, employee, spouse, employee, children, family, and that's just kind of the standard rule. Not so much. Um, when Obamacare came into play, we all know that when you see an employee spouse rate, it blows your mind. You're thinking, oh my gosh, that is so expensive. Usually it's because there's no employer contribution on the spouse part. And so the employee is bearing the total cost of the spouse. And if that employee is not making certain levels of income, again, depending upon the market they live in, um, that spouse might be better off going to the exchange and, and they might be better off getting a subsidy from the state um, to support the cost of that insurance. Well. As an employer, if you make coverage available for the spouse, then that employee and their spouse is no longer eligible for a subsidy. So we have now, as an employer, because no one counseled us, as an employer, we have now eliminated our employee's ability to cover their spouse and have it subsidized by the state. Um, and so they have to bear that cost entirely themselves. Again, that's a little brief kind of dis description of the scenario not in any way, shape, or form intended to be a full explanation because we should talk about those things independently. And those are a part of strategy. Many employers today, depending upon the pay scale of the employees, will say, we're not offering spouse coverage, not because we don't want to, but because if we do, we have cost our employees a lot more money because they can't be subsidized. So we've taken approaches to not um, pay for spouses, not offer spouse coverage, but we will provide a service to help that spouse get those subsidies um, with the state uh, plans and make sure that they have good plans as well. Ch children are a different story. You have child support court orders, um, which are mandatory in, I believe, every state. But uh, anyway, uh, so therefore children have to be able to be a part of a medical plan because if a court order comes in, and many of you have seen those over the years, then of course those, uh, you know, for your employees, then of course you have to respond to that if you provide medical coverage at all. So again, we can talk about those things in detail independently, um, but let's move into contribution modeling, of course, because the contribution component um, is kind of the bane of everyone's existence. Everybody hates it's like, how much do I have to contribute? Well, the standard for most plans, and you'll see it out there, of course, is 50% of the lowest plan available. If you're a small employer, you only have one plan anyway, but if you're a larger employer, you have multiple plans, is 50% of the employee only plan at the lowest level plan you make available. So um, that said, of course, that helps you start to work on your budgets. If your budget is, gosh, I can only afford as a company, not that we can afford anything, of course, I understand that, but I can only afford as a company $280 a month. Well, then we know that the cost at 50% of the employee plan can never be more than X. Um, not that you want it to be that high as well, I was just using that number. But the other side of the coin is we have to deal with affordability. Um, in today's world, employees can't pay more 
then it's just under 10%. I think this year it's 9.86% of their wage in healthcare benefits. So we always have to incorporate affordability as a part of a test uh, for any employer and certainly employers in certain categories um, to respond to ACA properly. So these are, these are educational components. And the purpose of this today is really education to help you, again, make intelligent decisions. And I know everyone's probably thinking, gosh, I just want to run my business. <laughs> I just want to make money at my business. I really don't want to know all of this. But it is a cost of doing business. And because it has become so expensive, we have to know it. The advancements, though, they're, they're helpful to everyone. First of all, there's advancements in underwriting. So high cost, uh, conservative underwriting that's far, less, far more discretionary, less scientific, are really gone. Um, underwriting has become very scientific these days. Um, it still is a conservative part of the industry. And it's a conservative component of insurance. However, it's much more factual-based and evidence-based than it ever has been in the past. In the past, it was very discretionary person sitting at a table looking at some information making a decision it was kind of gut instinct um, today it's very scientific plan designs are incredibly fluid um, you don't have you know state of California for example has 2,500 medical plans um, state of New York equally as as many usually you're presented with four or five if that maybe two or three you have a lot of options in the fully insured environment you have even more options in the level funded side of the business because you can literally sit at your desk and say, if I could design my perfect insurance plan, here are the components that are important to me in my employees. And from there, then back into building a plan or back into a plan that's already built that meets those standards. Um, you no longer have to say, gosh, just show me something and tell me what's available. Um, that really is not um, what you should be doing in today's world. Claims negotiation, claims processing, claims auditing are all critical components of maintaining your insurance rates. Rx planning, meaning what we talked about earlier, the way the formularies are set up, the Rx subsidies. We um, work with directly with the um, pharmaceutical companies in today's world to subsidize those very, very, very expensive drugs for people who do not have those included in their medical plans. And that will be a part of your association component as well, so that people who who are exposed and do require those incredibly expensive drugs. And you know, people can be cured today, but it's very expensive to do that. Most people can't afford it, and so they can't get the cures or can't get to the remissions they need to get to. And so um, the pharmaceutical subsidies are critically important. Um, managing the plans and certainly the federal changes that have come into the AHP plans to really open this door and this window for everyone on this, this webinar. The plan management is a component that has really been neglected for many, many years, particularly in the insurance brokerage community. Um, because you see your insurance broker once a year, maybe twice, maybe when they send you tickets for golf or send you a gift basket. But um, most of the time, they're not spending a lot of time on your plan. You really need a partner who is spending their time doing the work on your plan all the time to keep your costs down, make you aware of things that are happening that could affect future rate increases, et cetera, et cetera, um, and really focusing on managing that plan. That's an area that most people don't even know you should ask for. And, and don't expect it. But remember, you're paying your insurance agent a commission, which is a part of your rate. And if you're paying someone for anything else, you expect the work to be done, and we would expect that for you. Um, then, of course, the expectations of your employees. In today's world, is very different. And uh, for anybody who, who is in this generation, you're smiling. And for anybody who's in the prior generation, you're also smiling for different reasons. But anyway, um, you know, the availability of benefits in today's market is an expectation. It's not something unique. It's not something you hope to get. It really is an expectation. And in today's world, if we don't have benefits, we also don't have long-term employees. And so we have to get moving forward in that direction. And the AHP focus of the federal government really is a stimulus to help that happen. Um, you know, employees who are looking for jobs, I'm sure the same occurs with every business owner on this phone. One of the first questions in the interview is, do you provide benefits? And if you don't, there's always an impact, positive or negative, obviously negative. Um, you know, that person feels immediately when you have to say no. And there's an impact when you, for you when you have to say no. So it's, it's going to be a huge win for, you know, those opportunities when you're sitting in front of a potential recruit and they say, do you offer benefits? You'll say, I'm very pleased to say, yes, we do. And we know that you know that your competitors down the street may not. 
and this will put you in a huge advantage. Um, obviously, uh, from an age perspective, older, younger, et cetera, there are different expectations of benefits. From a family status perspective, there's different needs of benefits. And certainly, primary, secondary income earners, the needs are different. If you have a lot of secondary income earners, the other spouse may be carrying the insurance. That's a huge um, you know, opportunity for you from a cost perspective. If you are looking for that leadership group, those management folks, et cetera, then you are probably the primary job. And of course, your responsibility for benefits is very different. Um, and of course, everybody's looking for benefit suites today. It's not just medical insurance. Medical insurance is the key component that everything starts with. But you'd be surprised how many second income earners are using their income to pick up the, the dental, the vision, the life, et cetera, or the people that are primary earners need to have the whole suite because they you know nobody can afford dental care anymore nobody can afford glasses anymore um life insurance you can't afford to you know continue to pay the bills if someone passes away etc but on and on um you know the benefit suites are an expectation and those are not benefits that you as an employer have to pay for those are benefits that are ideal to make available um make sure they're priced properly so they are affordable and certainly that you have the structure from a IRS standpoint, Section 125 set up, Section 106 of 125 set up, so you can redirect the premium to reduce your payroll taxes and certainly their payroll taxes. And then, of course, we talked about the contribution equation. Um, you know, that drives an employee oftentimes sitting in that interview. Um, I can't tell you how many times it's been told to me that an employee will say, well, how much do you contribute? And this guy down the street contributes this much, and I need I can only contribute this much. And they start to negotiate. Like it or hate it, it is the world we live in today. And of course, uh, from an expectation in terms of products, these are pretty basic, but the, men the medical product benefit is the key. Your dental and vision are right behind it in terms of expectation. Life insurance is right behind it. As an employer, you can incorporate ten or $15,000 term life insurance for pennies on the dollar. It doesn't make sense not to do that for your employees, even if you don't have medical coverage. But for uh, additional coverage, employees, because they are employed through a group plan, can choose and increase their own life insurance in a much greater capacity for also pennies on the dollar, um, even at higher ages, because most people are not doing proper retirement or life planning, estate planning at home, and they do rely on that employer to provide those benefits. Then, of course, you have the, the biggest and uh, and newest plans out there in the market today are the gap plans. Don't be confused by hospital indemnity plans or someone who says this fills the gaps. I'm talking about real gap plans. If you've got a $5,000 deductible and you can't afford $5,000 if you're sick, then of course you should have a gap plan, which, does, which basically buys down that deductible, can be incorporated again for very, very, very low cost. Many times we embed them right into the plans, but therefore the first, let's call it, I'm just gonna make this number up, but the first $2,000 is taken care of for that employee, after that they take care of the next 3,000. The reason why a strategy like that becomes incredibly valuable for you and quite attractive is because statistically know, we know that an employee or a person only uses the first $1,800 of the deductible as a general rule across the United States, barring major situations annually. And so therefore, knowing that if the first $2,000 were covered of your deductible um, and then you have to pay the next 3,000, chances are you're never going to get past that first 2000 And in essence, what you've done is you've given right back to that employee first dollar coverage because now they don't have a deductible until they get the first 2000 paid for by their GAP plan. We can talk about that again in more detail. I want to throw that out there just because it's, it's part of strategy. It's part of thinking. And of course, disability, short-term, long-term, um, accident coverages, catastrophic coverages, et cetera, those are voluntary plans that employees um, employees can choose on their own very inexpensively. There are carriers that are very well known in the United States that you may or may not already have coverages with. It's important to shop that product as well. Many of the mortality tables, of course, mortality, ta mortality tables in general have changed, but also many of the plans have been filed differently to help reduce that cost. And unless you're shopping that product all the time, you're overpaying in those areas as well. And then, of course, as we kind of just kind of wire down here and we'll close down the uh, webinar is, you know, the employees today, and again, we are all either employees or employers on this phone call or on this webinar. Um, the expectation is to really have, you know, what is it you're bringing to me to encourage me to work for you? Um, aside from the fact that I need a job, it's amazing how many people expect a lot more for that job. Um, the telemedicine is a big component. 
obviously all of your plans will have telemedicine uh, incorporated into it. Free tax advantages, section 125, premium only is section 106 of the IRS code section 125. Obviously we'll work with you on that. All of your plans will be set up so that you and your employees have tax advantages. Um, wellness is an expectation in today's world. Those can be done for pennies on the dollar if it's something you wanna venture into. Um, HSAs, HRAs are kind of standard as well. Again, if you wanna venture into those, those are administered uh, for you um, from the association plan. But you're seeing people also now start to venture into tenure-based incentives, uh, performance-based incentives, and so on, as well as um, ancillary service access. And that's, you're seeing it all across the board where um, brokers are starting to add things into, well, if you do business with them, you know, you'll get whatever, free legal services for your employees for will preparation, et cetera. You know, you do or do not like those things. It's really a personal preference. The important thing is don't pay a lot of extra money for things that are not necessary. Make sure you're dedicating your money to be to pay for things that are necessary and the things that can be incorporated because there is a volume relationship and an association relationship but the things that can be incorporated for you at virtually no cost are important to take advantage of. And of course, everyone in today's world is expecting every, everything to be online, mobile, and easy to access. They don't want to deal with people anymore. And, um, and so everything that you're, we're doing for you and will continue to do as we develop these plans for um, the association will obviously be electronic, mobile, easy access, um, much more manageable for you so you don't have to add another employee to manage your insurance benefits now. And then, of course, we talked last week, what were the next steps? Profiling with a questionnaire. Um, you know, again, thank you to everyone who was very proactive and in large volume submitting their information. We appreciate that because that helps move the needle much faster into finalizing the overall AHP plan itself. And then, of course, <clears throat> Um, the components within that, which many of you who are large enough to, to have those standalone plans, um, obviously we're already in motion um, with calls and schedules and phone meetings and so on to get those in motion as well. But that, those components help build the risk and help build the support risk for the rest of the plan. So appreciate everybody who sent their information in, whether you are one employee or whether you are 200. I appreciate everybody. And then, of course, the next phase, which is what's happening right now, is underwriting. And then the next phase, we'll be coming back to you with analysis, which is also starting to happen right now. Some of you are already scheduled. And then, of course, delivery of the plans. We have that first week of December, um, you know, delivery dates um, tagged. And then, of course, first, uh, and of course, that second week of December, and then, of course, January 1, with a lot of work to do in the interim. So, again, if you haven't, if there's a few of you there who have not submitted your information, please go ahead and do that. Um, so that we can make sure you're integrated into the whole process. This certainly does not obligate anyone, but it's important to be integrated and to have knowledge because our objective, and again, as I close down, we'll open it for questions, but our objective is to keep your costs down, keep you very knowledgeable about what you're spending your money on, and give you the selections that help you customize your plans to serve your business properly and to serve the employees in your business properly as well as serve the association and make sure that the association is in a lead capacity in the association world, in the, in the large group world, if you will, to bring those deliverables to you so that it continues to increase the value of your membership and the value of the membership fees that you, you place into the association. The membership fee is very, very small for your association, as you know, and what you'll save in insurance premiums in less than a month will probably support your membership fee uh, for many years to come. So um, again, we appreciate everyone's time today. I hope this has not been too boring. Um, we try again to educate more than anything else. And uh, again, appreciate the questions and comments. So Carmen, I'll turn the, the call or the webinar back to you if you have questions that have come up. So Tracy, I think, uh, thank you. Uh, I think we wanna just do a really quick synopsis. So we're talking about a plan that is currently in an underwriting process. The first thing they need to do is complete the form and they can find that form. They'll be emailed that form from your office today. Everybody who signed up for the webinar will be emailed that form. But also, if they want to go preview last week's webinar, they can find that at ibpsa.com forward slash health plan. And I sent that to the entire audience about 30 minutes or I guess, yeah, 30 minutes ago. So um, ibpsa.com forward slash health plan where you can 
You can watch last week's video and also um, fill out the information and get the form sent to you. But if you've been on today's session, Tracy's group will send you the form. So Tracy, just a really quick recap. First of all, we're in the process of gathering information for the underwriting. Some people have already submitted information where you can start analyzing opportunities for them. But this is not a one size fits all. In other words, people can pick and choose what they need, correct? To a certain extent for themselves and or their employees. <laughs> Absolutely. You'll have a, a lot of fluidity um, in the plan designs themselves throughout the associations throughout the United States. Okay, fantastic. And the other thing, folks, is I think what Tracy and I were having a conversation yesterday about the difference of how many insurance companies there are from state to state that can practice in that state. And Tracy, didn't you say that there was like 2,500 or more insurance companies that could practice in California, but over in the Carolinas, it was just a handful? Of <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's do. kind of a, a, a little mix up of those details. There's about 2,500 insurance plans. There are multiple insurance plans. carriers, um, but you get into, you get into, you know, that's certainly the one of the largest states. And then you get into a state like North Carolina, which is one of my favorite states in the United States, but a state like North Carolina, that has lost almost all their carrier uh, options. And so, you know, there's there's different um, ability based upon where you live, yes. but there's also more flexibility than you've been presented with by your local broker because there is a lot that can be done, um, even in the Carolinas beyond what you've been presented with. Okay, so um, I think the point I was trying to get to was that just because you may have a plan, you may be with somebody in one state, doesn't mean that a, the same member will be part of that same insurance carrier in another state. So we'll all have the same same plan function under the Kaiser Group that will be managing for us, but we're not all going to be Blue Cross Blue Shield, or we're not always all going to be Kaiser Permanente. Or <laughs> that's not the way that works. Right, right. So, <laughs> that's correct. Right. So uh, <laughs> because last week, um, the funny thing was, is uh, Tracy clarified today that she's that the Kaiser Group is not Kaiser Permanente. The reason that was important is after last week conference call, people thought it was Kaiser Permanente. And so we wanted to make that clear that each of you will have um, a plan that is specifically designed for you. And if you choose to offer some benefits to your employees, um, what those benefits will look like. And everybody's will be different because all y'all have different, different needs and requirements. Um, so the first thing is uh, you're going to get an email from Tracy. You're going to fill out the form. When they get that form back, they're going to call you. They're going to set up a time to call you. You're going to have a discussion. And then at that point, you're in the analysis ready to have your plan delivered type function. Is that correct, Tracy, once they get those initial processes done? That is correct. And um, those are in varying states right now of, you know, from beginning to um, analysis, of course, and, and presentation for delivery. So they're depending upon yeah. how quickly people got information in or supporting the supporting data or answered questions, et cetera, um, you know, is, and, and of course, if you remember on the questionnaire, it also, there are uh, three different sections in there to identify if you needed immediate assistance or you were, you know, not in a rush, needed something next year. But for those who needed immediate assistance, those are the first ones that are in the process, of course, and then everything follows that. Right, and I, I encourage you to mark if you need immediate assistance. Last week, we had people whose plans ended on November 15th and who, through no fault of their own, the insurance company just decided they didn't want to carry them, so they were scrambling to look for new plans. So please let the Kaiser Group know if you need that information quickly, uh, and they will address that right away because we want to be very responsive to our members. Also, the other thing I'd like to say to you all is if you have friends who are not part of the association who are in our industry, but they've never joined the association, please tell them where to go to the website to fill out the form. It's worth their time to at least fill out the form and see if they were to join the association what how the how Kaiser Group could benefit them. Um, so I encourage you to uh, reach out to your friends who may not be part of the association and give them something to consider. Um, again, you know, membership is uh, only just over $300 a year. That's not very much. And if this plan in the first month can save you that $300, 
um, then that means all the rest of the money it saves you throughout the year is money in your pocket. And that's what we're trying to do is make it uh, feasible and affordable for you. Tracy, do you have any last thoughts for us before we close the webinar today? I would always have lots of thoughts, but no one wants to listen to those for the next couple of hours. <laughs> but um, I, no, I, I do want to say to everyone, um, and I, I know that rather casual discussion, but I think it's easier to listen to than you know sometimes formalized presentations. But um, I do want to again thank everyone. Please be proactive um, in getting the information in so that everybody can win. You know, in the association plans. Um, and in this new world of association plans that the federal government has approved. Um, it's a perfect time right now to get control. It's a terrible subject, I understand it, and it is a terribly boring subject, um, but it has become such a huge cost driver for your business. I just wanna encourage you to take, just grab it, you know, and take hold of it, and, um, and let us help you reduce those costs. And with that, I'll turn it back to Carmen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. If you have any questions about the webinar, please feel free to reach out to IBPSA at the Kaiser Group and they will be happy to answer those questions or you can direct your questions to me, Carmen, at IBPSA.com. And if I don't know the answer, trust me, I'll get you an answer. I wish you all a successful rest of the week. We will not have a webinar next week uh, since it's the Thanksgiving holiday. I hope you have a very successful holiday season, and we'll catch you the week after Thanksgiving with another update of where we are on our insurance plan. Bye-bye.